from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Jason Steinhauer, and I'm a program specialist here at the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Before we begin today's program, please take a moment to check your pockets and purses for cell phones and other electronic devices, and please set them to silent or to vibrate. I'll also uh, take a moment to make you aware that this afternoon's program is being recorded uh, for a future webcast on the Library of Congress and John W. Kluge Center uh, pages. So uh, just be aware uh, that if you ask a question during the Q&A, um, you will wind up in the final webcast uh, that is put up online. Today's lecture is presented by the John W. Kluge Center in conjunction with the Embassy of India and the Library's Hebrew Language Table. We greatly appreciate the Embassy's participation in our programs here at the Library, and a special thanks to uh, Mr. Sridharan, Counselor of Press, Information, and Culture, and his staff at the Embassy of India. The John W. Kluge Center is a vibrant Scholars Center here on Capitol Hill that brings together scholars and researchers from around the world to stimulate and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. The center offers opportunities for senior scholars and postdoctoral fellows to do research in the Library of Congress collections. We also offer free public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs, and administer the Kluge Prize which recognizes lifetime achievements in the fields of humanistic and social science studies. So I urge you to please visit our website, loc.gov slash Kluge, K-L-U-G-E, and learn more about the programs and opportunities for scholars that we have here at the library. And I also urge you to please sign our RSS list. We send out semi-regular email announcements about future programs that we're doing as well as what opportunities for scholarship are currently open for you to apply for or for your colleagues to apply for. So please sign up uh, on your way out. There's a sign-in list um, on the table. Now, today's program is Jews and New Christians in Portuguese Asia, 1500 to 1700. And the lecture is being given by Professor Sanjay Subramanian. Professor Subramanian's CV is much longer than I can articulate here uh, in my brief time. He's an, an accomplished and distinguished scholar um, who has received world recognition for his work. Um, he is presently in residence here at the Kluge Center as our Chair in Countries and Cultures of the South. This is an endowed chair position that we have here at the Library of Congress for senior distinguished scholars. Um, Dr. Subramanian is a distinguished professor of history at uh, UCLA in Los Angeles and the founding director of UCLA's Center for India and South Asia. He has published extensively on medieval and early modern history of India, the Indian Ocean world, and Eurasia. His list of titles is long. I won't uh, repeat it here, but please do uh, look at his website on, and webpage on the UCLA uh, faculty site to see a full listing of his publications. Uh, he is currently on the editorial board of the multi-volume Cambridge History of the World. Um, he was educated at the University of Delhi and the Delhi School of Economics and spent the first decade of his career teaching economic history and comparative, comparative economic development at uh, Delhi School of Economics, where he was named professor of economic history. He is taught in Paris, and he was appointed the first holder of the chair in Indian history and culture at the University of Oxford. Most recently, he was elected to the Collège de France, one of the world's most distinguished academic institutions. He will become one of 52 permanent professors in the institution and will be responsible for covering the field of early modern world history. There's much more that I could say, uh, but uh, I'll let you um, hear from him yourselves. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Subramanian. 
Thank you very much, or perhaps, as I, sh I should say on the occasion, uh, uh, which is about all the Hebrew I know, so don't uh, push me further on that question. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about Jews and New Christians in Portuguese Asia, which is an interest of mine uh, stemming from uh, not so much Jewish history as such, but actually from the history of the Portuguese Empire. So I come at it really from the, from the other angle. And the materials that I'll be using are essentially then the materials of the Portuguese uh, Empire, but sometimes uh, somewhat uh, on the fringes of it. So let me begin uh, with this uh, text, a very interesting text published in Amsterdam at the end of the uh, 17th century in the 1680s. It's a text in Portuguese called uh, Notícias dos Judeus de Cochin. Uh, and it is written by someone who goes by the name here of uh, Mose Pereira de Paiva, uh, who, as you can see, it says, uh, printed this book. It's, it's really a little pamphlet at his own cost. Um, uh, it turns out that this is actually uh, a pseudonym, and it's more likely that this person was really someone, a jewel merchant, by the name of uh, Pedro Pereira. So he actually changed his name slightly for the purposes of this publication. Um, the text is, as I said, relatively short. And uh, what it essentially tells us is how uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, Mose Pereira de Paiva, or Pedro Pereira, uh, made a trip to uh, the Indian Ocean uh, in a context which he doesn't tell us very clearly about, but we know from other sources had to do with the jewel trade uh, of his own family. Um, and uh, in the course of this trip in the Indian Ocean, which took him uh, to Gujarat and to the port of Surat, the great port of the Mughals in the period, he decided to visit southwestern India because he had heard that there was a substantial community of Jews over there. So this is actually an account of his visit to southwestern India and how, as you can see, Relação do Carinhoso Acolhimento que Experimentamos, which is uh, an account of the warm welcome that he was given. Uh, and in the course of this warm welcome, he begins actually directly by mentioning a series of names that you can see over here. So you have uh, the people whom he meets, David Castiel, Joseph Zakai, David Levy, and so on. Um, and he gives us then, uh, as the pages proceed, a sense of the uh, composition of this community that he encounters. And it turns out that it is a very, very complex composition. So he actually gives you a sense of who the major families are. Uh, and, of course, he also makes it clear that there are Jews who are present in this port of Cochin uh, from uh, very, very different uh, uh, time periods. Right? So there are some very old communities, which he's aware of. And then there are more recent communities, uh, some of whom date to the 16th century, some even to a few decades before his own arrival there. For example, one of the people whom he mentions uh, is uh, from the family of uh, Rahabi, uh, and it turns out that these are people who uh, have come from Iraq a, s a few decades before he actually paid a visit to the town. Now, at the time that, uh, that Pereira uh, came to Cochin, uh, it was um, under Dutch control, or at least one part of the town was under Dutch control. Uh, the Dutch had built a fort there, uh, or rather they had transformed an earlier fort that existed and, and, and improved it, and this fort was a fort which had been built by the Portuguese in the course of the 16th century in bits and pieces. The initial foundations of this fort go back to 1503, uh, but it was uh, subsequently improved uh, in the course of the uh, rivalry between the, between the Dutch and the, uh, and the Portuguese. And what we see over here uh, then uh, is a situation in which uh, uh, this structure, uh, which is um, uh, presented here from the 1630s from a manuscript which I'll return to, uh, in fact, uh, is the European settlement, what is normally known in the Portuguese of the time as Cochin de Baixo. Uh, that is to say what is called normally Lower Cochin. But there is another part of the town which is not clearly shown over here at all and which um, is not very clearly visible here either because if you look at this uh, uh, sort of sea view of Cochin, you can see that mostly it's European style buildings that are being depicted in the distance. But there is another very important part of this town which exists, which is normally called Cochin the Sima, which is to say Upper Cochin. And this second part of the town, and the fact that this town is actually divided into these two complementary parts, is really crucial to our story. 
right? Because it's the fact of this division and the fact also of an existence of a kind of situation of multiple sovereignty, which is going to be at the heart of the whole, whole uh, issue of the relationship between Jews and, and New Christians uh, in this context, but also we'll see much more widely in Portuguese Asia. Now, um, Cochin, you can see over here in the, in the southwest of India, uh, which is going to be, of course, at the center of a number of remarks that I'll make, but I will also range much more widely and talk about a number of other centers, which you see depicted over here. Goa to the north of, of Cochin in southwestern India. You have Hormuz uh, in the, at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. Uh, but we also talk uh, briefly about Macau and even about Manila, which is technically not a part of the Portuguese Empire, but in, in some senses is linked to it because of this connection between the Spanish and Portuguese empires uh, of the time. Now, if you want to go back uh, to uh, the earlier levels of the presence of uh, the uh, Jewish community in southwestern India, which Mose Pereira the Paiva is, is well aware of, uh, he was certainly aware of the fact that uh, there was a presence of uh, Jews uh, dating back uh, to the first millen millennium, certainly. Hmm? Uh, he was not very certain exactly how far it went back, whether it went back, let's say, 15 or 1600 years, or a shorter period than that. But there was something which he was actually not aware of, but we are aware of very well. Hmm? And that is the fact that there was, in fact, a very strong set of commercial connections that were built between the Eastern Mediterranean and Western India in the course of the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Right? And this is a connection that we know of and he did not know of, essentially because of the famous collection of papers of what are known as the Geniza of Cairo, of which you see an example over here, uh, which are written sometimes in Hebrew and sometimes in what is called Judeo-Arabic, so using a mixture of Arabic and, and Hebrew. And these materials show us a very rich uh, commercial uh, linkage between uh, a number of centers that you see running up from the southern tip of India all the way through to Gujarat hmm, on the one hand, but on the other hand into the Red Sea and then eventually into what would today be Syria and Lebanon, but also what would be Egypt and eventually North Africa. Right? And there are trading communities then which go back and forth and we are able essentially because of the uh, work in particular of the scholar uh, Shlomo Goiten and the recent publication posthumously of this massive book on the India trade that he had long been planning, uh, we now can actually track a number of participants in this trade. And we also know what their centers were. Uh, their centers uh, included places like Kollam, but not Cochin, which at the time of this trade of the 12th and 13th centuries was not a significant center or a significant port. Now, um, when, when the Portuguese uh, begin to interest themselves in this trade uh, and decide to actually enter into the trade of the Indian Ocean, which is in the second half of the 15th century, they are not aware of uh, a, a Jewish mercantile presence in the Indian Ocean. They don't actually have a very clear notion uh, of it. Um, we know that uh, in the case of both uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, there was this very complicated and, and tense relation which has to do with this long process which is often called the reconquest. That is to say we know that from the 8th century onwards there was a moment when uh, the uh, uh, various Muslim armies had entered Iberia, had created these states. Uh, you can see uh, at a certain moment that these states went pretty far up north, uh, what is colored here in, in yellow. Uh, but then uh, from uh, about the 12th century, a process begins by which the Christian states reconsolidate themselves, push back, and eventually wind up creating this set of, of kingdoms. So you have the kingdom of Portugal, whose boundaries are defined relatively early by the middle of the 13th century. And then you have the kingdom of Castile, the kingdom of Aragon and of Navarre. And then you have, of course, this last holdout to the south, which is the uh, Kingdom of Granada, which remains under Muslim rule until that uh, uh, fatal year of 1492. Right? And so we know that this is this very curious process, this very interesting, not exactly coincidence, which is to say 1492 is the year of the final expulsion of the last Sultan of Granada. It is the year of Columbus's voyage and it is the year of the decision by the rulers of Castile and Aragon to definitively uh, suppress a presence of Muslims and Jews in their kingdom. Right? So all these three things happen at the same time and it is not a coincidence. 
Now, what is um, often paid less attention to is the fact that um, with a delay of four years, the Portuguese then uh, implement a similar but not exactly the same policy. Right? So this is in 1496 and 1497. And again, here there is an interesting coincidence because then, uh, again, the decision to suppress the presence of Muslims and Jews in Portugal coincides with the first Portuguese voyage to India, which leaves uh, the estuary of the Tagus in July of uh, 1497. Uh, the Portuguese and the, 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 the rulers of Castile and Aragon have a different policy in the following sense. The uh, Portuguese are actually not that interested in expelling the Muslims and Jews. They are rather interested in keeping them there but in converting them. As a French historian once put it, the difference is the rulers of Castile want to expel the Jews from Castile and the rulers of Portugal want to expel them from Judaism. So they actually want to keep them, but to want to get, make sure that they're not, uh, they're not in, the same, in the same religion. Now, uh, this is going to create a uh, situation in which you have uh, a set of people who come to be denominated, uh, though it is a slightly older denomination, but uh, it becomes a typical Portuguese denomination, which is to, to say, to call these people Christians Novos or New Christians, which could be applied to Jews and to Muslims converted to Christianity, uh, but it is usually more applied for whatever reason to the Jews than to the Muslims in the case of, of Portugal. Now, these people are essentially the ones who I'm going to be talking about, which is to say uh, the uh, new Christians, many of whom remain under constant suspicion on the part of the Portuguese crown and its various disciplinary mechanisms, which include the Inquisition, which is brought into Portugal in the 1530s. And there is a constant suspicion, sometimes justified, but sometimes exaggerated. And there is a long debate amongst Portuguese historians, which we can return to if you wish at some point, about whether, in fact, many of these people were really crypto-Jews, as they were often thought to be, or whether, in some senses, it was the paranoia of the Portuguese state which portrayed them constantly as such, even when they were really not so. So this is an, an, an interesting debate because a, a, a very famous Portuguese historian, uh, Saraiva, once said that uh, the Inquisition is the manufactory of the, uh, of the crypto-Jew, right? That actually the Inquisition manufactures them even when they don't really exist because it, it is, it's necessary to have this enemy within uh, for, for certain purposes. Now, when the first Portuguese uh, voyage sets out in 1497 uh, and eventually winds up in southwestern India, it doesn't go to Cochin. It goes to a port which is slightly to the north of Cochin, which is Calicut, which is a more important port at this point in time. Uh, the Portuguese uh, voyage is partly improvised in the sense that uh, they know their way around the Cape of Good Hope, but they don't really have a very good idea about navigating inside the Indian Ocean. So they're actually going to pick up informants as they go along and they pick up a series of Muslim and other pilots on the east coast of Africa who help them across. But one of the people whom they pick up as an informant on the, um, on the, way, on the way back, hmm, uh, actually in a set of little islands near Goa called the Anjadiv Islands, is a man who comes to spy on them, hmm, who's sent by one of the neighboring sultanates to spy on them, the Portuguese become suspicious of him, and they eventually catch hold of him, they torture him, and he confesses that he's in fact a Jew, a Jewish merchant, uh, with a very complicated background that he actually comes uh, immediately in his immediate past from Alexandria, but his family seems to be actually from Poznan in Poland. Hmm? Um, and this man is seized by the Portuguese, and they immediately convert him. Hmm? We don't know what his name was before conversion, but his name after conversion is Gaspar, which is the name of one of the three Magi, right? so one of the three kings of the Orient. And he's also given the name Dagama because his godfather at the moment of conversion is Vasco da Gama. So he comes to be called Gaspar da Gama, but he's also sometimes familiarly known as Gaspar da India, right? Gaspar from India, which is, of course, um, a bit of nonsense in the sense that he was not from India. Um, now, this man, Gaspar, is a, a very important early informant of the Portuguese. So he's taken back to Portugal in 1499. He has an interview with the king of Portugal, and he gives them an enormous amount of essentially false information. So he gives them a portrayal of, this, of the geopolitics of the Indian Ocean, where he tells them that everywhere, everybody is Christian. 
which is of course completely false. Uh, and he tells them that actually there are a few Muslims here or there. For example, you see in the case of Bengal, he says that the king is Christian, but the subjects are Muslims. Hmm? But everywhere else, if you can, if you can see, uh, it seems if you follow him that in Ceylon, everybody is Christian. In Sumatra, everybody is Christian. In Thailand, everybody is Christian. So this is somebody who is giving them false information based upon the idea that this is their expectation and give them what they want. Now, um, Gaspar stays in Portuguese service for about 15 years, and eventually he gives them some rather better information. Eventually, his son, called Balthazar, also enters Portuguese service. And as we move from this initial moment of Vasha da Gama here, imaginatively portrayed by a 19th century painter in front of the ruler of Calicut, um, as we move from this moment, this first encounter, to the 1510s and the 1520s, we get a presence of more and more uh, intermediaries who are helping the Portuguese, and some of them we can clearly identify and give names to who are actually uh, Jewish, or were Jewish and are converted by the Portuguese. Now, the Portuguese have a two-part attitude towards these people. Some of them, they want to convert. And the problem with those whom they convert is we then lose traces of what the names and identities were before conversion. So we know, for example, of two of the most prominent uh, informants of the Portuguese in the 1510s. One is called Francisco de Albuquerque, and he is very close to Afonso de Albuquerque, and uh, he probably takes, again, his name from, from the person who is responsible for his baptism. And another man called Alexandre de Taide. And uh, again, we don't know who, what these people's names were before, before conversion. Uh, but it seems that uh, these people, unlike Gaspar, are typically um, Jews with an Iberian connection. Mm -hmm. They are people who are either Castilian or Portuguese-speaking Jews. Sometimes they speak both. And sometimes they also speak Italian. Mm -hmm. And so these are the people through whom the first governors of Portuguese India are going to actually execute a series of activities and missions. They will use these people to translate. They will use them actually even to translate diplomatic documents. They will use them in embassies and missions, not giving them usually the full responsibility of the embassy, but in a sort of a secondary position. So there will usually be a Portuguese uh, who is a sort of principal ambassador and then the accompanied by let's say, Francisco de Albuquerque or Alexandre de Taide. This is the case of the first Portuguese embassies sent to Hormuz or to Iran uh, and so on. Now, um, in the rest of the, the talk, I'm actually going to focus on um, four of these characters who sort of navigate in and out of the Portuguese empire. Two of them belong to the 16th and two of them to the 17th century. And since time is uh, a little uh, on the short side, I will try to be uh, brief, but not too telegraphic. So um, let's think about these people as two pairs. So the first two, uh, Garcia de Orta and Giacomo de Olivares, who are both in the middle of the uh, 16th century. And the next two are actually quite closely linked for various reasons, which is Antonio Bocaro and Samuel Castiel. Now, uh, Garcia de Orta and Giacomo de Olivares both come uh, to uh, Portuguese India at roughly the same period, Orta a little bit earlier. He comes to Portuguese India, so far as we know, in 1534. He's born in 1501, and he belongs to a family of doctors. So he is essentially someone who is, uh, practices medicine, and he uh, comes to be associated with a fairly significant nobleman of uh, the time. Uh, a man called Martim Afonso de Souza, who those of you who know something about Brazilian history would be aware of. He's one of the earlier, earliest people who settles and has what is called a donatory captaincy in, in Brazil. And uh, Martim Afonso de Souza comes to India in the 1530s as Capitão Mor do Mar, which is a kind of a secondary title below the governor. He's the sort of head of the fleet, and he brings Garcia de Horta with him. Now, Garcia de Horta then spends um, the remaining years of his life in India. And it's very difficult to track what exactly he did and when. His main base was clearly Goa, but actually it turns out that he also had a small uh, uh, presence and uh, a house and a garden in what eventually became the island of Bombay, which was actually ceded in part to the Portuguese in the course of the 1530s. And much of what we know about him actually comes from the fact that he published a book which is a very unusual book from many respects. It's probably the third or the fourth book actually printed in Portuguese India. 
Uh, and it's interesting because it's the first book which does not have a religious content, which is published in Portuguese India. So if you actually look at this, the title page of this book, you can see, of course, that it has the viceregal permis permission. It says, Com privilege du conde de uh, It's called Colloquies du Simples de Drogas e Coisas Medicinais de India. So uh, colloquia uh, on the simples. So uh, drugs and simples are often opposed to each other as, as products. Uh, of India, and also with concerning certain fruits and so on and so forth. Uh, and it says that it was composed by Doutor, so he's using this title, uh, Dr. Garcia de Horta, who is a phys physician of the king. And uh, that it also gives you a sense of who has actually uh, given the permission because the inquisitor, uh, Alessius Dier, uh, as you can see, Inquisidor Nestas Partes, has actually given permission for the printing of this book. Right? The Inquisition, remember, was set up in Portugal in the 1530s and arrives in Goa in 1560. So this is a fresh inquisitor who is given permission to print this book. Now, this book is also, and I'll just say that very briefly, it's, the printer is also interesting because uh, the printer is German. Right? Uh, the printer is someone called Johannes von Emden. Hmm? Uh, so you, actually, you have a German printer in Goa who's printing this book for a, a converted Jew who is a, a doctor. Now, um, what does Garcia de Orta actually um, tell us in this book? It's a very uh, interesting book. It has a very curious literary form. It's in the form of conversations. That's the reason why it's called colloquies. And there are various characters, invented characters, who ask each other questions. And then there are responses that are given concerning various products, and so on and so forth. It's a very badly printed book. It has a huge number of printing errors. Hmm? Um, but it is a very, very interesting book from many, many points of view. It's, very large, it covers a very large number of products. And if you actually read through this book, you get a sense of what Garcia de Horta was really up to. You get a sense that Garcia de Horta was actually someone who circulated quite widely in the western part of India. That he actually did not stay in Goa, uh, or even Goa and Bombay, as many people often thought he did. But he actually circulated quite widely in this broad region, where there were a number of Muslim courts. And so it's clear that he actually traveled in these Muslim courts. He offered his services to sultans like this one. This is the Sultan of Ahmed Nagar, Hussein Nizam Shah. And uh, we do know from a number of uh, indications on the other side, though Garcia de Orta is never mentioned by name, that Europeans were present in these courts and that these courts often used them for a number of different purposes, above all for two things, as doctors and as uh, mercenaries and artillery men. So that was the other function that they would often perform. They would uh, be um, uh, running the artillery. Sometimes they would also be founding cannon. So for example, uh, here is a Bijapur manuscript from the 17th century, which so shows you on the one hand the sultan in possession. But if you actually look at this other painting, there is a European who is actually over there. It's a very curious painting uh, concerning a kind of a, uh, some kind of Zoroastrian or Mazdean magician. But you can see a European who is depicted there in his sort of typical European dress. So there is this presence of people like Garcia de Horta. Um, and we know that he actually had pretty good Arabic and that he acquired Persian, because he often gives etymologies for words and medicinal terms and so on, which suggest a knowledge of Persian uh, in this work. So this is someone who circulates and who winds up having a certain success. But at the end of his life, eventually, um, uh, there is a problem, which is that uh, after he dies, the year after he dies, uh, his family is investigated. His, uh, his uh, sister is brought before the uh, Inquisition and burnt uh, in Goa. And uh, eventually, his uh, remains uh, are dug up and also burnt uh, on, the, on the accusation of being, being uh, a, a crypto Jew. And uh, many of the copies of this book are, are destroyed. But what happens, which is actually particularly interesting, is that though the Inquisition destroys the book and tries to destroy the physical traces of Garcia de Horta, the knowledge remains. And this is an interesting process because, in fact, the whole text is taken up by two people. And I'll just tell you very briefly about this. So on the one hand, by a, uh, a Franco-Dutch uh, savant called uh, Charles de Lecluse or, or Clusius, who does a version of it into Latin. And then this other version, which is done by another Portuguese by the name of here he is giving his name in Spanish because he's translated into Spanish. Cristóbal Acosta, which is Cristóbal de Costa. And this is a book which is uh, actually, as he says very clearly, it is uh, el cual se verifica mucho de lo que escribió el doctor García Lorca. 
So he's actually taking uh, the materials from Garcia de Horta. The big difference is that he actually has uh, also added some woodcuts hmm, of plants and so on. Uh, there are also some quite amusing little woodcuts of elephants and, and things like that. So uh, uh, he actually is trying to give this book a, a greater sort of attractive character. So this is one kind of personality that you can find sort of navigating in and out, in and out of the space of the Portuguese empire between this Muslim world and the world of the Portuguese who gets away with it for a very long time. In fact, gets away with it throughout his whole life, but eventually um, is, 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 uh, has to face the consequences of it posthumously at least. Now, um, part of the reason why uh, the Inquisition became suspicious of Jews like Garcia de Horta was of course the fact that uh, having arrived in the Indian Ocean, there continued to be an anxiety about whether uh, these were people who were in communication with Muslim powers. Now, we can see this was in fact true with Garcia de Horta. He was, he was actually circulating inside Muslim courts, but what is actually important uh, is that the main uh, thing which is troubling the Portuguese at this point is just as they are extending into the Indian Ocean, the Ottoman Empire is also extending into the Indian Ocean. Right? So 20 years after the first Portuguese voyage of 1497, in 1516, 17, the Ottomans conquer Egypt, they conquer the Red Sea, and they start sending ships into the Indian Ocean. And so this is, there's a whole sense of, of uneasiness around this. There's a sense that eventually the Ottomans might want to get a foothold in India, that they might want to actually send their auxiliaries and build alliances with the Indian kings. And there is a sense that uh, some of these uh, uh, Sephardic Jews might in fact be, in a sense, uh, uh, giving information to the Ottomans, useful information to the Ottomans. But at the same time, of course, um, there's this ambiguity because uh, the Portuguese uh, administration is aware that these people could also give them information about the Ottomans. Right? So there's a sense in which there's a sort of going back and forth uh, of, of, such, of such people. And the second person that I mentioned to you, uh, the contemporary of Garcia de Horta, whose name is Jacome de Olivares, is an example of this. Okay. Very quickly give you a sense of his life. He shows up in India in the late 1530s. He is not an intellectual, he is a merchant. He's a merchant who, we know something about his genealogy, his mother was, was a, a new Christian, his father was an old Christian. But uh, he shows up, he comes to Cochin, he settles in Cochin, and there he marries a new Christian woman and begins to trade pretty much across the breadth of the Western Indian Ocean, and eventually he even manages to trade all the way into Southeast Asia. So he actually has a sphere of activity running from all the way from here we know quite a lot about him for one simple reason, which is that eventually, in the uh, late 1550s, he's caught by the Inquisition. And he's tortured in Goa, and he gives a very extensive, he gives a very extensive uh, confession. Now, of course, this is the usual problem that we have, which is how much of, actually is, of truth is in these confessions, and how much of it is actually what the Inquisitors want to hear. But there's a number of interesting details which he tells us. Now, um, the main, of course, thing which the inquisitors want to catch him on are practices. And of course, the main practice they always catch them on is Purim, right? So the whole, uh, which is which normally these people call uh, the day of Mordecai. That's the, what is, how the, the term normally appears in these confessions. So there's this idea that they practice these things, that they also that they insult the statue of Christ and so on and so forth. And the usual way of going about it, besides the confessions, is that since these, he's a rich merchant, he has slaves. So the point is you normally get to the slaves first, the slaves confess, and then you use the slaves' confessions to try and extract other confessions from other members of the family and so on. Now, if you actually look at Giacomo de Olivares, you get a sense that he's someone who, had the Inquisition not got hold of him, would have been perfectly all right in Cochin. And uh, he would have been all right trading between Cochin and Malacca and, Western, and the Western Indian Ocean. What eventually happens, however, is the Inquisition gets hold of him, sends him to Lisbon, and then eventually, of course, it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because he then winds up escaping from Lisbon and going to Istanbul. Right? So he sh actually shows up in Istanbul where he gets into contact with the usual suspects, that is to say, uh, Joseph Nassi and uh, the, the whole set of people who are associated closely with the, with the Ottoman court. He's given a position, and so, so far as we know, he ends up his life over there giving information to the Ottomans about uh, the commercial and other networks of the Portuguese Empire. So this is another kind of a trajectory, someone who actually we don't know, and his main uh, biographer, one of my students who did a dissertation largely on his career, uh, José Alberto Tavim, 
in, in the new, new University of Lisbon, suggests that uh, it's very difficult finally to know when he's wearing a mask and when he's not wearing a mask, what he believes and what he does not believe. But what is certain is uh, eventually the repressive mechanisms of, of the Portuguese empire force him into a situation which may not have been the situation which he would have preferred, but we have no means of knowing that one way or the other. So let me then move to, forward to my, my uh, uh, next or last two examples, which is the cases of uh, Samuel Castiel and Antonio Boccaro. Now this is, this, is, this is another interesting pair. Boccaro was uh, a member of a very famous new Christian family. Uh, his brother, uh, who was called Manuel Boccaro Francais, uh, was a physician, but he was, uh, the family was actually a very prominent family in uh, producing canon. So they were actually a very, they were, they were canon founders as well. And Boccaro was born in 14, 1594, and he came out to India about the age of 20 in 1614. And he then served in the fleets of the Indian Ocean uh, for the next 15 and odd years. The main reason why he's prominent is because at the end of his life, he actually became, interestingly, the official chronicler of Portuguese Asia. Right? So he actually wrote this uh, so-called decada, which is the form in which the official chronicles used to be written. So he's the third official chronicler after João de Baros and Diogo do Couto. He's the third official chronicler. Now, um, so you could say in some sense he had a level of official acceptance. Uh, he's writing this uh, text in the 1630s. But actually, it turns out that Boccaro had a much more checkered life before he came to be accepted as the chronicler. Because um, uh, in the uh, late uh, 19th and early 20th century, some scholars found uh, two very important documents about him. And one of these documents is actually uh, his confession uh, before the Inquisition. So this is, uh, we have the text of a confession that he gave to the Inquisition in uh, Goa uh, in uh, 1624. And um, after which he was actually absolved and forgiven and reintegrated and was therefore able to become the official chronicler. But in the course of this, of this Inquisition uh, examination, what he tells us uh, is that, um, that uh, he tells us who his parents were, uh, Fernando Bucaro Cristão Novo, Medico Morador in Lisboa, e de sua mulher Guiomar Nunes Cristã Nova, so the, his parents were already new Christians living in, in Portugal, that he actually um, and his brother were very curious about Judaism, and they had heard that there, was, there were Jewish communities in the Indian Ocean. So he actually came out to find out about them and whether he could reintegrate himself in some sense into these communities. So what does he tell us? He tells us he came out and uh, he tried to contact these people in the other part of Cochin. Right? So he went to Cochin, he was in the Portuguese section, and he tried to contact the people at, on the other side. So who were the people on the other side? Well, the, the thing about Cochin which you have to be aware of is that the Portuguese never conquered it. The Portuguese were there on a contractual relationship just as they were in Macau, right? So they actually had a contract with the local ruler who had given them a chunk of land and they had built a fort on it, but it was not a conquest, which for in juridical terms is extremely important, right? So the king of Cochin was still always present. He had his palace, he had his court, he had his own life in the other half of the city. And in that court, from the uh, certainly 1550s and 1560s, he had some very prominent, prominent Jewish advisors some of whom uh, were uh, Jews from uh, India uh, of long standing, what would often later on be called black Jews, uh, but there were also Sephardic Jews who were present over there. And um, so, in fact, uh, Bukharo got in touch with some of these most, uh, most uh, prominent uh, of them. He got in touch with the person who had, at that time, the title of what is called Mudaliyar, hmm? uh, a kind of a, uh, a title which later on the Portuguese would translate this as Regidor. Uh, a kind of a ministerial post, an advisory and ministerial post, a man called David Levy. And he contacted him and said that he wanted to reconvert and become Jewish. And Levy was extremely suspicious, and this is what Bukharo tells us in this confession. He said, I kept persisting and I kept asking him, and he kept saying, no, this is a trap. And what you're doing is you're trying to get us to do this so then the Portuguese will come and invade the king's land saying, you are now reconverting people to Judaism. So he actually refused to touch him. Now, at a certain second moment, he then contacted this person that we have, Samuel Castiel. And I'll come back to Castiel briefly before I conclude. So he, he contacted Castiel, and Castiel, on the other hand, said to him, 
What we will do is the following. We will not do this in Cochin. We will go to another smaller inland settlement called Parur, where there is a small community of Jews. There we are far away from the Portuguese. We are far away from the domains of the king of Cochin. And there we will reconvert you. And he then proceeds to do this. And he says he remained then uh, in that situation for, for uh, a number of years. But then he changed his mind. And he began to have doubts. He started reading Christian books again. And he began to have doubts about the, 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 the truth of, of Judaism and started to actually think that he had made a mistake. And so he actually says that in this situation, he was also, as it happened, found out. And, uh, but he's now decided it was all a big mistake. He wants to come back and become a Christian. And this is essentially what he says to the Inquisition. The Inquisition accepts it. They do not actually uh, subject him to any major, major form of punishment. And he's then reintegrated. As, as we can see, he becomes the successful chronicler. Now, the problem, however, is this, that um, he has actually given away a number of names. He's, he gives away a number of names of other new Christians who are, as he calls them, Judaiz Judaizers. But he also gives away the names of, especially of Samuel Kashtia. Right. Now, Samuel Kerstiel is someone with whom the Portuguese have ongoing dealings because one of his other functions is that he's the lingua, he's the interpreter who actually does the translations between the Portuguese and the kings of Cochin. So they actually have an ongoing dealing with this man. And this resentment builds and builds and builds. So through the 1630s, if you look at the Portuguese archives, they are constantly talking about the menace of Kerstiel and the problem that Kerstiel represents, how Kerstiel actually has got the year of, of the ruler, how he's actually going to eventually bring the ruler of Cochin into an alliance with Muslim powers and perhaps with the Ottomans. Uh, the Ottomans by the 1630s are not very interested in the Indian Ocean, but still, there's this still residual paranoia there. And eventually, what this leads to is a situation in which they, uh, the, the, the Portuguese settlers of Cochin uh, mount a, an armed raid. Uh, they go into Samuel Castile's house in 1643 and kill him. Now, this has very major consequences, as I'll come to in a second. But um, the question is, who was this man anyway? And uh, I've been um, doing a little bit of, of work on this because I first encountered him more than 20 years ago. Uh, and it turns out that he actually belonged to a fairly prominent family. And this is a very f prominent family called the uh, Ibn Yahya, who were uh, uh, actually present in, in uh, Portugal and Iberia from at least the 11th century. You see here. The, the, the genealogy going down, and he belongs to this branch of the family, uh, Solomon ibn Yahya, David ibn Yahya, and Jacob Tam, and so on. Hmm? And this very prominent two brothers you have over here, one is Gedalia ibn Yahya, who died in 1575, who lived in Constantinople, and his brother, Yosef uh, uh, ibn Yahya, who was also in Constantinople, and who was a prominent physician of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. So he belongs to this family. Um, but he actually, this is, we want to follow the genealogy a little bit more closely. So you have, uh, so you have these two brothers, and he's uh, one of three sons of Gedalia. Well, he's descended from one of three sons of Gedalia uh, uh, Ibn Yahya. So you have the first Samuel Kishtiel, born in the 1530s, who arrives in the uh, 1550s probably in Cochin, and is normally the person who people think is partly responsible for building the synagogue in Matanchere. So this is the, the, Jew, the famous Jewish synagogue, of course, much reworked. Hmm? But this synagogue was built in the 1560s by this first Samuel Kirstiel. And the Samuel Kirstiel whom we are dealing with, whom Bukaro was dealing with, is actually his grandson. So this is the third generation. Hmm? There's an intermediate person who I think was called David Kirstiel, but I'm not entirely certain. Hmm? So this is the family from which he comes. Hmm? And uh, so it's a prominent family. There are also two other brothers. Jacob ibn Yahya, who actually remains in the Ottoman Empire and is quite a prominent figure in his own right, and Isaac Pinto, who is uh, also quite interesting because he's, he, he navigates between Cairo and the Western Indian Ocean, and he's quite well known in terms of passing information uh, to the two sides on military activities and so on and so forth. So this is uh, the person that you have whom the Portuguese actually eventually assassinate. But not officially, it's a sort of an unofficial assassination which is done by the Portuguese settlers of, of Cochin for fear of his influence. And in that construction of this figure of this man who is a sort of evil genius behind the ruler and so on, so uh, you have, of course, uh, the uh, confession of Bukaro is a, a piece which, is, which plays a certain sort of important role.
So let me conclude. So what is the consequence of this? Actually, the consequence of this is really very curious. I said to you that the Dutch conquered Cochin in 1663. Now, how did the Dutch conquest happen? The Dutch conquest, of course, partly happened because the Dutch had superior military power. There's no doubt about that. But the Dutch also, for instance, attacked Macau. They never did not succeed. So why did they succeed in the case of Cochin? And the case of Cochin is very simple. The reason why they succeeded is because the rulers of Cochin decided they preferred the Dutch. Right? Now, why did the rulers of Cochin decide they preferred the Dutch? Because in the 30 years leading up to the Dutch conquest, there had been a whole series of uh, problems and a whole series of conflicts. Some of them we know quite well. Uh, the, the Portuguese had a tendency to interfere in the family politics of the rulers of Cochin. Uh, there was also the fact of there's an island called Venduruti in the bay of, uh, in, the, in the estuary of Cochin, which the Portuguese claim to have rights over. There was also that. But in fact, the whole episode of Castiel is very crucial in alienating the rulers of Cochin. Right? And so in a certain sense, what the rulers of Cochin saw this as doing was interfering with their sovereignty, interfering with their right to actually run things as they wanted in their part of Cochin, uh, and they felt that the Portuguese were overstepping what was eff effectively a contractual relationship where they were meant to actually keep one part of the town and allow the, the, the rulers of Cochin the other part of the town. And so in some senses, you could look at this episode as uh, at least a significant one in tipping the balance and pushing the rulers of Cochin then over to the, um, over to the, uh, to the Dutch. So in a certain sense, you could say that um, for all of this going back and forth and all these tensions uh, that we have, we have seen, these difficulties faced by these individuals and so on, uh, there's also something else which we must uh, bear in mind, which is that uh, overall we could say that um, uh, this is a case of pretty uh, uh, evident uh, uh, mismanagement and, and incapacity of the Portuguese state finally to come to terms with these new Christians at all. They, they would use them from time to time. They would uh, ask for their money. When the Portuguese tried to set up an East India Company in the 1620s, they went to the new Christian community of Lisbon and asked them for their money. But uh, a few years into the uh, contract, they said that um, uh, some of the principal people who had contributed to it would be reinvestigated by the Inquisition, which was actually a way of telling them that they were not going to give them their money back. So there is a sense in which there's this constant incapacity to, to deal with, uh, with the, the new Christians. They want them, but they don't know what to do with them. They don't want to expel them. They want to use them, but at the same time, they don't really have a sense of how to arrive at a, uh, at a solution or, a, or a, 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 a political solution uh, which, would, which would work. And this is, I think, a part of this ongoing difficulty which we see, uh, whether at the level of the state or indeed at the level of these individual trajectories. So let me stop there. Thank you. The white Jews? No, actually, uh, you can see, so you asked whether the white Jews were crypto Jews. No, in fact, what we can see here is that they were both. The ones who chose to live in the Portuguese part of the city, right, yeah. uh, would have been either crypto Jews or they might actually have been con converts who are actually converted, who knows. But in fact, what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is that in this whole regime, because of the divided sovereignty of the city, it was possible through the whole Portuguese period for you to be an open and practicing Jew, but not in the Portuguese part of the town. You had to be in the other part of the town. Because someone like Samuel Castiel, either of them, either the one who was there in the 1550s and 60s or the other one, they were not crypto Jews. They were actually openly practicing Jews. But they were able to do so because they were in the king's part of the town and they were under the king's protection. No, actually, um, the Portuguese speak very little about the Bene Israel. They don't have very many contacts with them. Uh, and um, probably at this time, most of the Bene Israel were actually um, at, in, in interior locations. And the Portuguese presence was a very largely a coastal one. Uh, 
you don't get a sense uh, even in the little bits of information you have concerning, say, the area of Bombay where the Portuguese were, or Chaul, which is another settlement, that they had much by way of dealings with that, that community. The community existed, but they didn't really have, so far as I can see, many dealings. So, so I, I, I'm, yeah. Right. But, you know, yeah. Yes, but you know, I mean, um, for a long time it was believed that after the expulsion or after the uh, edict of 1496 that there were no Jews in Portugal. There were Jews who used to come to Portugal. And it's very interesting, I mean, the same, my same student, uh, José Alberto Tavim, actually has written about these two or three characters, uh, one of whom actually called Isaac do Cairo, who actually um, was a spy and a translator, and who actually made four uh, overland voyages on four distinct occasions between Portuguese India and Portugal, carrying information for the two sides. And nobody had any doubts about the fact that he was Jewish. Now, he was required after the 1530s to wear a yellow star on, his, on, on the, the shoulder of his jerkin. But there was another man who was actually a very prominent North African merchant called Abraham Benzamero, who actually had a a, uh, he was called, uh, the joke used to be about him that he's a Judeo de Sinal, Saint Sinal. That is to say, a notable Jew, but who doesn't have to, really have to wear the yellow star. Because the king had actually given him a specific dispensation from wearing the star because he had enough money. So now you could ask yourself, what is this man doing? Why does he want to go to Portugal in the first place? Isn't this very dangerous? Isn't it the case that and, you know, matters could turn against you at any time? But it seems that these were people who either for commercial reasons or sometimes for sentimental reasons or for whatever reasons, did continue to have this, this dealing. And so far as we, we know, uh, Castiel, for instance, continued to speak Castilian and, and Portuguese. He also clearly spoke Malayalam, uh, which is why he was the translator. Yes. Garcia And more precisely, his descendants are scattered around the world, including the foreign minister of Timor Leste, and they're very proud of their. Uh, uh, Ramos Horta. Mm -hmm. I think in the case, I think the two cases are, are different. I mean, in the case of the of the Castiles, what actually happens is that they survive, and as you can see, when Mose Pereira the Pava goes there, he actually meets a, a direct descendants. Right? So he's killed, but his his children are still there, and they persist there, and they will remain through. Uh, uh, you know, in the in this in the 18th century, there are some very very great Jewish merchants of Cochin, at this time under the Dutch, who are openly Jewish, but uh, the most important of them are the late arriving Baghdadi Jews, uh, the Rahabis. But the Castiles are still there. So we can actually see that there is a, a, a continuity which is preserved from the middle of the 16th century forward. The case of Garcia de Horta is more complicated. Um, a, a, a French scholar called uh, Israel Salvatore Reva actually uh, did a, a very interesting essay on the family. And he tried to actually track uh, the family. Uh, it would seem to me that um, there, uh, well, first of all, the Portuguese, um, uh, you know, attitude towards him is extremely strange in the sense that now they want to make him out to be a pioneer of tropical medicine and so on and so forth. But this is a 19th century move. When you're trying to recover him, you know, and trying to put the Inquisition into the past and trying to, you know, keep the Catholicism down and, and so on and so forth. But the reality of it is that the people who kept Garcia de Horta alive as a, as a figure in the 16th and the 17th century were, were not the Portuguese, were, 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 which was actually above all Clusius. And, and Cristobal de Acosta, but especially Clusius. And from Clusius then, uh, he was picked up and he was used by the doctors in the Netherlands. Uh, 
Uh, he's a, a sort of um, in the standard libraries of all the great Dutch doctors of the first half of the 17th century. And in a way, I think that it's more the Sephardic community of, of the Netherlands which keeps his, uh, keeps his, his name or his, his memory, memory alive, which is then recovered eventually. You know, I, I mean, uh, sometimes the Portuguese will also try to remind you that Spinoza was, you know, sort of Iberian, right? But I mean, he was, it was not because he was Iberian that he was Spinoza, and it's, well, maybe he was, but I mean, if he had remained Iberian, he would not have been Spinoza. So there's this very great ambiguity eventually about wanting to take the credit for this, while at the same time not acknowledging the fact that all of this was done, in some senses, against the current of, of what the Portuguese state really wanted. Yes. Um, uh, Xavier's letters, um, let's see, because you see, Xavier spent time in Goa. He spent time on the very, very southern tip of India, and there's what is called the fishery coast, where there were no Jews. Uh, he did not have, so far as I know, very extensive uh, dealings with Cochin. Okay. Now, you also have to bear something in mind, which is that uh, remember that the Jesuits actually have a very uh, complicated and contradictory attitude towards the Jews, because the first generations of the Jesuits are actually extremely tolerant towards them. And, and uh, in fact, for instance, uh, Ignatius is quite open to the idea of recruiting Jews into the order. Hmm? But when you move into the second and especially the third generation, things become much more difficult. The, the Jornada. Oh, that is the, okay. Now, the Jornada is a text of the Dom Frey Aleixo de Menezes, who was an Augustinian and who was the Archbishop of Goa, who went to Kerala, but for a very different reason. That was actually in order to suppress what they thought of as deviant Christian practices. Because there were, remember, very old uh, Christian communities in uh, Kerala whom the Portuguese constantly suspected of being. Uh, Nestorians or Manichaeans or influenced by these Middle Eastern heresies and whose liturgy was in Syriac, whose uh, priests were married. Uh, sorry, that, that yes, and, and so this, I mean, the, the, the Jornada is actually about the tension between those people and the Catholic hierarchy. But if you look at the Jornada, there's not very much there, practically nothing there about the Jews. Um, you know, the, Dom Frey Alessio de Menezes has very extensive letters also. It would be interesting to see whether he says anything about the Jews. But, but I mean, it's, it's, it's in, in, interesting to see how many forms of um, so-called deviant religion the Portuguese were looking for and finding and trying to suppress all over the place. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we, uh, unfortunately, to stop there, another round of If you're interested to hear Dr. Subramanian speak again, he will be speaking here at the Kaluki Center in July. Uh, it'll be his final uh, lecture uh, for his tenure as a Kaluki chair. Uh, July 13th, I believe? July 11th? Like July 11th. Uh, but please do sign up for our RSS list on your way out so we can send you the announcement and uh, you can join us again for Dr. Subramanian's next lecture and as well as other lectures by scholars. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.